Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to our seminar. Um, so I'm really thrilled um, that we have Sarah Jacopi here to talk with us today. Uh, Sarah is an assistant professor at University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and um, a center investigator at the um, Penn's uh, Injury Science Center, where she's also uh, a postdoctoral fellow. She earned a uh, MPH in population family health from the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, uh, has uh, nursing and uh, PhD degrees from University of Pennsylvania, and clinical experience as a trauma and surgical intensive care nurse. Um, what I think is really particularly um, amazing is how Sarah has sort of ex expanded her reach into really challenging areas. Her work focuses on uh, experiences of underserved injured people living in and recovering in urban environments. And her recent research investigates how sociocultural and environmental factors contribute to racial and ethnic disparities in injury risk and outcomes. She also studies operational and institutional intersections between trauma care and law enforcement. Um, we in public health are very, very comfortable looking uh, routinely at gross differences in outcomes on violence and other things with respect to race. And we're also very comfortable in looking at how things vary geographically within cities like Baltimore, for example. But rare do, rarely do we in public health kind of really try to answer that why question. Why are things so uh, distributed in such a dis, disproportionate manner uh, as they are? And that's what Sarah is going to discuss with us today in her studies in Philadelphia. So take it away, Sarah. Thanks so much. Um, if you have any questions as we go, I know you have to speak to it in a microphone, but feel free to interrupt. I'm a little bit more informal. But like I said, I'm coming from the Penn Injury Science Center. Um, we are a sort of a new injury research group, but very interdisciplinary um, from nursing, medicine, public health, epidemiology, and criminology. And we really developed out of what was used to be called the urban health lab. So our focus is, is injury and violence, but generally we all focus on issues around urban health and urban phenomena. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is a study that was really like, if I can plug interdisciplinary you know, thought experiments, it would be this study because this is really the culmination of me sitting in, a, in, a, uh, in an office with two other postdoctoral fellows, one of whom is a social epidemiologist who does geospatial analysis and the other is a criminologist and then I'm a a nurse and who is interested in recovery environments in the city. So we were just talking, came together, and then this is sort of what came out of that um, that work. So just to give you a little bit of background on my on me, I was trauma nurse in Philadelphia for several years, and uh, most of my research is qualitative. I did um, ethnographic research with um, trauma patients and tried to try to understand their interpretations of. Um, racism both systemically and structurally in their recovery experience. Um, this is a quote from Talib, who I spent a, a year following in the hospital and then in uh, clinical visits after, um, after he was injured. And he really taught me a lot about what it meant to feel embodied by the neighborhood, your neighborhood of origin. And in addition, when he went home to recover in the neighborhood that he was injured very close to, you know, the, the additional trauma and isolation of trying to recover and have a new fear of the place where you're trying to, to heal and reestablish your, you know, economic and social well-being. So that really, like, it really made me think a little bit more about how important neighborhoods are in terms of both risk profiles but also in the recovery profiles of injured people, um, especially gun-injured people. Um, I obviously, like in many cities, Tulip's not alone. Um, in Philadelphia, every six hours somebody is injured or dies from a firearm injury. And it seems that in the last 10 years or so, there was a trend towards a decrease, a pretty marked trend, which is now, it's, it's increasing again. And 
I think for me personally, like working in the hospital and seeing patients, there are some definitive racial and age-based patterns in who is injured. It's predominantly, like in many other cities, young men of color who are injured in Philadelphia. Homicide rate for um, a, young, a black man is about five times that of a white man. Um, and again, you know, I really like that. That's a nice. That's a nice demographic. And we're, we constantly do studies where we're we're comparing people by by social and demographic groups. But I really like the study that was done about 20 years ago, or this this paper that was written about 20 year, years ago that asked the question about violence in American cities. Young black men is it, males are the answer, but what's the question? What are the root causes? What are the what are the factors that put certain people at risk of gun injury and not others? And recently, there's you know this among many other studies tried to look at the root causes of these racial disparities and violent violence victimization and really highlighted the differences in exposure to risk environments, to exposure to risky settings, settings in which people, somebody would be more likely to be injured than another. Um, and so about two years ago, our research team was able to get data from the Philadelphia Police Department on every injury, firearm injury um, that occurred within the city from 2013 to 2014. So this included data on age, race, type of injury, and the location of the injury to the block, um, and, as well as the resident, the, the block of the, in, of the injured victim, of the, the block of residence of the injury um, victim. And so this is a study that was published last year, just a brief report to just examine the nature and the extent of racial disparities in gun violence victimization in Philadelphia. You can see here there's all the way to the right. This is just the, the broad hotspot mapping of firearm violence in the city. Um, it maps cl somewhat closely to the residents of, uh, so basically people who are injured might live close to where they um, were injured. And it also tracks are highly correlated to uh, places of poverty in the city. Um, and then looking across, looking at this by racial groups, white victims tend to live near where they were injured, but not where white people in the city lived, right? So they, li they were injured in areas that were not typically a white segregated neighborhood of the city but this was very different for black victims, right? Black victims tended to be injured and live in the neighborhoods that have the highest relative segregation in the city. I don't know that this, if this is particularly surprising, um, but it was something that I thought about when you know, I thought about when I think about the larger work that's done, specifically at the injury center, uh, the injury center at Penn, which focuses less on policy as it does on place-based interventions and ways to think about how you could create sustainable and easily um, scalable place-based changes that decrease injury risks, particularly around vi firearm violence. So, two examples are a recent uh, study in which um, they trial. We trialed. Um, greening of previous vacant lots. So if you change, if you take a vacant lot and then you, you green it and put a small barrier fence on it, and this, is, this was done um, across, I think, uh, 300 trial lots and with 300 control lots, and compared the violence rates around those blocks, what, what appears to be um, emerging is that it does have some impact on the rate of firearm violence and other kinds of crime in the, in the surrounding block groups. Now, currently, there's a trial of, of doing something which is just basically changing the aesthetic of abandoned housing by um, putting up, by, by basically cleaning windows and doors so that you, you create an aesthetic that perhaps symbolically changes how people feel, uh, both feel, feel safe or not safe or engage in criminal behavior. Who I'm not really sure of the mechanisms that underlie why we see impacts of these kinds of um, place-based um, interventions, but the the ethos behind it is based in the in Friedan's like health pyramid, uh, in which you're trying to change the context or change risky environments so that p individuals default to not necessarily well, it is healthy to be nonviolent, but do not engage in in violent behavior around perhaps context of disorder. And this this extends to 
policing tactics as well. There is some movement to move towards hotspot policing. Making it, uh, Chris Coper talks about making a case for a place, like looking at places and not people, as the ideal target for uh, init uh, for, for policing um, interventions. Um, so I know this is incredibly, you know, it's a, it's quite a, um, quite a heuristic. It's pretty, it's pr pretty complex. This is Nancy Krieger's um, eco-social theory that links racial discrimination to health outcomes. And so where, at, where I was, I think it's, it's wonderful that place-based interventions like greening has impacts on crime. When I think about patients that I took care of and did research with, I recognize the complexity in their lives and their lived environments. And I just, I wondered what, what else and what other, um, larger structural um, racist forces in the city create different risk environments based on on race, and so this is this is multiple mechanisms that link racial discrimination to health outcomes. In Nancy Krieger's opinion, I was really interested because I think I had I'd seen nothing done in this area before on historical context. So, what makes certain places more risky, and how can we begin to study them? Um, and so I started, before I was a nurse, I studied archaeology, right? So I was really interested in <laughs> what artifacts remain that we can look at, like, the historical antecedents of these place-based differences. What are the artifacts? And one thing that I initially thought of was maps of city redlining. Um, is everybody familiar with redlining? Or yes? Assume that we're not. Assume that you're not. Okay. So briefly. Um, in um, the wake of the Great Depression, FDR, and as part of the New Deal, um, basically uh, created a program that would um, empower more local, 200, about 200, I think 238 cities, to provide government-backed mortgages that would increase home ownership. So hopefully stabilize the um, housing market a little bit, and, and you know, in 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 the context of the depression and provide um, uh, low-cost mortgages. And to do this, this was he, uh, or the, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board set up what were called housing owners loan corporations in each of the 248 38, um, cities of interest. And what they did was they asked the, these, these, these corporations to map, the, map their cities and indicate what parts of the city would be the best, the safest options for government-backed mortgage lending, and what parts of the cities would be risky, would yield probably a bad return on investment, even like even an investment that was intended to subsidize uh, the population. And so those that made these maps were often they weren't there wasn't a standardized formula, and they weren't a standardized set of actors. They were often the um, people with local interest in the housing market. So they were real estate appraisers, bankers, um, loan officers, and their, the criteria was very broad. So the green criteria, that's the best. That's the places where you really should think about investing in, um, in, in city space. So these were areas that were not fully developed so that there was land to be developed, but they were also um, had a high probability of, of um, a return on investment vis-a-vis -vis attracting affluent home buyers. The blue areas were, again, areas that were safe vis-a-vis -vis, um, affluent home buyers, but were already developed. So there wasn't a lot of space to build new houses, but they, these, are, these, are good, these were good and stable areas. Yellow areas were places that were already developed but had a uh, inflow, what was considered high probability of influx of a low-grade population. And herein becomes is is where we get to sort of this becoming a racialized hierarchization of city space, because um, the definitions of a low grade population were typically African Americans, immigrants, and Jews, and also mixes. So so places where there wasn't segregation. So if there was um, unharmonious mixes of different racial populations, this was this starts to become these areas that were less attractive. And then red line, red red zones were. Um, the places that were ha hazardous. So these are typically um, places where African American populations lived, sometimes uh, immigrants lived, and also where the housing stock had signs of degradation or there was like inf informal housing settlements. 
So this is um, this. There was three sets of maps that was done at, were done in Philadelphia. This is the last one that was conducted. That was developed in 1937. I just want to point out a couple of things as we move forward. Um, as you can see, there are parts of the city, such as the southern and northern part, that weren't zoned. Those were farmland in the 1930s, no longer, it's no longer farmland. And in the southern part of the city, around the naval yard, that wasn't an area where there was a lot of residents. So it's, they're just not zoned areas. So this isn't a complete map of the city as it is today. It, it represents a little bit about, more about what was happening in 1937. The term redlining is obviously comes from the red zoned neighborhoods of, or the red zone regions of the city. So we wanted to look at the relationship between this, this historical hierarchization um, of, of, of place-based discrimination and the context of contemporary firearm violence in the city. And so we overlaid the map, or we imported the map actually as a raster la layer into um, ArcGIS and used, this is 2010 um, census tracts of Philadelphia. Actually most, I mean there's some, there's some small places where there's a little bit of misalignment because now there's, for example, a highway that runs the east side of the city that didn't exist in 1937, but more or less, it, it, these, these sort of, the census tracts fell into, uh, into 2010 um, uh, census, uh, uh, the, sorry, the map, the, the zones fell within 2010 census tracts. And you can see, I don't know, this part of the, the center part of this map is not zoned, and that's the center city neighborhood of, of Philadelphia, which is the place that, that continues to have probably the most, uh, the most uh, municipal resources and community amenities. It's like the, the, the very downtown area. So again, that's also not zoned in this, in this map. So this is what our our units of analysis looked like. And then we want, because we wanted to look at um, the potential confounding of socio-demographic factors around the time of the map was made, we, uh, we imported um, 1940s, the 404 1940s census tracts uh, that were available from the, the, the National um, Historic Global Information Systems that is, um, it, it keeps all, um, historical GIS data that can be used for analysis, and it's kept at the University of Minnesota and can be publicly um, accessed. In any case, we took the 404 1940 census tracts and overlaid them into the 2010 census tracts based on their internal centroid. So whatever was the, wherever the the internal centroid of a 1940s um, census tract was located, we we placed that within our 2010 um, ArcGIS layers. And then on top of that, we, um, we layered all firearm assaults from 2013 to 2014, and that was about 20, yeah, 2,175 in total. And from that, we were able to generate a hotspot map, basically, uh, to have a look at what census tracts held the most concentration of contemporary firearm violence. We also wanted to look at general Violence. So, was this just an issue of firearm violence, or was this violence in general? So, we pulled all violent crimes. So, that included aggravated assault, rape, uh, aggravated robbery, and placed that across our census tracts. And it, you can see there's a there's a more variable spread when looking at all t all types of violent crime when as compared to um, firearm violence. But generally, again, clusters in very specific parts of the city. There's not. There, there are places where it's highly concentrated, as might be in many other cities. So um, following the work of Samson in Chicago, people who want to look at neighborhood effects, we thought about how are we going to, how are we going to account for segregation and, and, what we, and concentrated disadvantage, which is a metric of social, economic, and political marginalization in a, in a spatial, at a spatial scale. And so the way that we think about, or that, that researchers think about concentrated uh, disadvantage now is based on uh, percent of the population under the poverty level, percent of the housing units with, uh, that are female headed, percent of the housing, uh, percent of the population that's youth under the age of, of 18, and then occasionally, sometimes, a level of unemployment and, um, I th and, and percentage of the population on public assistance. Those are not 
data that are available looking at the 1940 census. So we had to create what would be our sort of a creative metric of concentrated disadvantage. So things that would um, mirror that somehow. And so this is what we came up with and happy to, you know, to talk about it further because I mean this is really, this is rather arbitrary but we thought these were good metrics of those same phenomenon. So the proportion of the population that was older than 25 didn't have a high school degree in 1940. The per per proportion of homes that were rented occupied, the proportion without a radio, a mechanical refrigerator, or any form of central heating, and the proportion of homes with more than one person per room, so relative crowding. Um, so this is just this just shows the descriptive statistics that we were working with. Um, it's interesting that in 1940 there wasn't the 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 population of Philadelphia was 90% uh, was labeled in the census as 90% white and nine about 10% black and there wasn't a lot of, of variation beyond that and that that may be that they just wasn't captured that their people were people would have categorized themselves in other ways but this is what we have to work with um, and you can see. Um, and there was a good amount of variation in terms of the other metrics that we used to think about concentrated disadvantage. Um, to point out here, and I think it's important, is that when you look at the Hulse zones, so the, the, the different zoning blocks of the, um, of the 1937 map, um, a, a much larger proportion was red, yellow, or blue than was green, which is our reference category. Um, and then a good proportion was also not zoned. So a good proportion of the of currently um, residential neighborhoods in Philadelphia was not zoned in 1930, 37 and 40. So we looked at this in sort of in a using um, lo looking using Bayesian um, Poisson models to look at the relationship between space and I and what would be the, the relationship between uh, firearm violence and what would be predicted by these historical antecedents. And so this is a little bit different than multiple regression. It's, it, it's not really statistically significant. It's just supported by the models. So statistically, yeah, that's, that's how I'll speak about it. And it's, a, uh, it's an incidence rate ratio. That's the differences that you're looking at here. So, in the first model, we're just looking at firearm violence incidents per census um, tract by the zone of interest. And what you can see is what might look like, with very, very wide intervals, a, rel a, a relatively dose responsive relationship between um, what was between, uh, what in comparison to a green zone. Uh, blue zones were four times have, have currently a four times more likely is four times more likely to have um, firearm um, injury rates. Um, the injury rate rate in um, yellow zones eight times and per, up to thirteen times higher. That's just that's unadjusted. When we look at um, other 1940s socio demography. Um, and include that in our model. You can see that those those numbers are attenuated, but the pattern persists compared to the most highly desirable um, areas for mortgage lending in the 19 late 1930s, early 1940s. Today, in 2013 and 2014, there's a much higher incidence rates of firearm violence. That same pattern didn't really play out when we looked at all all kinds of of violent crime. It was a little bit different, and probably because that was more spatially distributed across the city. Um, when you looked unadjusted models, it seemed that there was a relationship, and they, sim it was similarly progressive. As you look at the different hierarchy of the, of the zones levels, you have a higher um, likelihood of, or higher rates of, of all types of violent crime. But once um, once we adjust for 1940 census variables of interest and in our standardized metric for concentrated disadvantage, that more or less goes away, except for the space that was unzoned in, uh, in 1940, which makes sense, because now there are people living there, so higher rate of potential for violent crimes. So obviously, this is, this is a study that, was really, that, that really looks 
broadly at association, potentially looking for the antecedents of, or, or one, one aspect of understanding how long-term structural racism may play into differences in, um, in exposure to risk environments today. But there were large areas of the city that weren't developed in 1930s. We are broadly limited to both our current and past census um, variables, and so that, it may be that, that areas in Philadelphia just don't, haven't changed over time. That the places that were disadvantaged in 1930 remain disadvantaged in 2013 and 2014. And that is what uh, really drives the high rate of fire, firearm violence victimization. It also might be that what was segregated in, um, in the 1930s remains segregated today. And Philadelphia is one of, I think, the top 10 most cities in the, in the United States has, has the highest relative segregation, particularly for the Afri African American um, in neighborhoods um, are more separated than any other group living in the city, are more and more isolated. And, and are, are, um, th those neighborhoods, those areas of the city are home to the majority of firearm violence. Um, so this is not really strong, strong um, evidence of, of causation. This is a lot about correlation, but it's, it, is a, it was a thought experiment to look back in time and to think about what we have available. There aren't that many artifacts, so to speak, of historical forms of place-based discrimination. This is just, this is one. I mean, and, and I think that if we had the time and the opportunity to look at the changes in, in the city demography over time, um, we would have a much broader picture of the pathways and perhaps the potential changes in the city that, that link these two, link, link a map with contemporary uh, distributions of firearm violence. Um, and so I think this makes me think about what, so what is this, what, what, what meaning does this have? What do we do with this kind of information? So we have, there's a relationship, but we are living in a, in, um, in 2016, 2017, now we have to think about um, how to enact evidence-based models for violence prevention. So what can we do with this, you know, this historical perspective? And again, so I come from a, an injury center that's highly, fa uh, highly focused on place-based changes. And so I just, these are some pictures from a streetscapes from n places that are in those violence hotspots. They look very different. And so I think there's different implications for different types of, of inputs at the level of city or violence prevention programs that might be um, considered when, when looking both at contemporary hotspots but also the, the, the long view, the, per, the um, perpetually disadvantaged neighborhoods that exist in Philadelphia. And that might need some very different types of interventions when, for example, um, comparing this type of streetscape with this type of streetscape. But in our city, we spend a lot of time thinking about center city and building new skyscrapers in that part of the city that already has all of the amenities and all of the, uh, all of the advantages. Um, and it's really, it continues to be the focus, that small, small area of the city continues to be where all of our, or not all of it, but the majority of our development resources go and not in enriching and trying to think about ways to improve the, uh, the larger periphery of the city that really contains what we would uh, what, what we would consider our gun violence problem. We also spend a lot of money in the acute care of injured people. So that's sort of my perspective. We spend a ton of money in hospitals providing acute and emergency care and not in the prevention and not in, the ch and not in challenging risk environments that are, not, that are risky today but also may have been risky or had their had the, the, the had their risk profiles created over over centuries, perhaps. Um, so, this is the paper that we wrote. It's in press right now that really describes the study and the the methodology that we used, um, and has a little bit more detail. If you're interested in trying to replicate that, perhaps in Baltimore or other places. Um, there's also a variety of ways to look at at place based. Um, um, the relationship between violence and place, and also 
thinking about um, different ways of, of engaging eco-social um, theory to look both at the current ecology, but also the generational and historical uh, develop, social development of, of our contemporary urban health ecologies. Um, and I just wanted to pull up, this is, this is the redlining map of Baltimore. And there's been studies that have, have looked at, um, I don't know that your city, so <laughs> this is your city. But uh, I've, looked, I've read some studies that looked at uh, differences in, in environmental uh, exposure to uh, environmental risks from like uh, factories that, are, that, that have changed since the 1990s, but prior to the 1990s, the people that lived in red zoned areas of the city would be much more likely to have exposure to unhealthy um, environmental exposures from like factories and, and the industrial um, processes in the city. And that's sort of what I have today. I can go back in detail, but happy to engage you all in some so conversation. I, I want to talk about this map some, but I, I would like to um, just ask you a question yeah. about uh, you're examining, it's fascinating looking at the um, 1940 data predicting your contemporary gun violence spatially. Um, as you was, I think, sort of hinting at is sort of, okay, what does that causal path look like? And I, I wanted to know, had you looked to see how those, that, that redlining uh, predicted concentrated disadvantage now? Yes, yeah. As opposed to, to others. And the other sort of things that aren't too difficult to map, like um, ab abandoned dwellings and other sorts of things, because things that would indicate disinvestment, right, of, of uh, neighborhoods. So have, have you looked at that? Or we haven't that? looked at vacant, and we have that data. We actually could easily do to, to map the uh, vacant housing unit, uh, the relative concentration of vacant housing units. Um, we have not done that, but we, we actually we started doing this whole study looking using 2010 and um, census data but I mean was it was on the causal pathway so we were sort of we, we went back and tried to find historical data but when we it, it looks exactly the same so 2010 data really didn't change I mean attenuated the relationship between the zones and the rate of firearm injury but it um, it didn't really uh, it didn't really change too much else related to that yeah should have brought that. Were exceptions uh, in, in your general data points. So when you put up the Baltimore map and looked at the red zone, there sort of uh, we had a massive investment in our in our harbor area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was right in the red zone here, and so aside uh, aside from that massive investment, I think things would probably correlate in a similar way. So I'm just sort of curious on the Philadelphia side. Sure. Yeah. It's like along the line, someone said, uh, even though this is really rough territory, we're going to put a lot of money in there to try to develop yes. it. What, what's happened? Any, any stories? Yeah, sure. I mean, from what I, I from what I know in Philadelphia. All right. So if this is this is so one thing that would is one reason that that, that we have maybe less of a problem with that is that Center City neighborhood is not mapped, right? So this would be, because within Center City there is nuance, right? There are, there were areas that, um, there's a neighborhood called Society Hill, which even in the 1950s and 60s was, it was one of, the, it was more dilapidated. It did have these like grand old homes, but that was an area that was purposely reinvested. It's now one of the most expensive, within a 30 year period, one of the most expensive territories in the city. So that would have been a problem, but it's not mapped. Um, I think that um, potentially parts of this 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 area of Center City, there hasn't been the same thing as a, this, maybe like a little bit here. But this still, that's actually, I think this is going to look different when, if we look um, 10 years from now. Because this is that, those both of these parts of Center City are probably the most rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods in the city. Um, and, but that has, been a, that has been a change that occurred in the last um, five to 10 years. So I think if we did this again and looked at it again in 10 years from now, we might see some 
some sort of variation because of the planned investment or the very, very intensive investment in particular neighborhoods. But other than that, not really. Yeah. Uh, I, I can fire up a bunch of stuff. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm Hal from the MPH program here. I have a question for just for clarification. What you did in your research is that the examine the association in uh, the area back in 1937 and kind of a risk score in using the census data of 1940 to predict the the current area where violent crimes occur. Is, right. is that correct? Yes. Oh, okay. so, yeah. so it seems like to, to me the lessons we should learn from your research would be uh, if you don't do it, you know, it's hard to change the situation. So if you don't do anything, the situation continues like another 70 years or so. So that's kind of my comment. Yeah. There, was, there isn't much change in Philadelphia. I think one of, the, I mean, maybe I didn't, I didn't specify this. The, one of the reasons that I was looking specifically at this map is it's, it was an explicit form of racial discrimination. So it was racial exclusion from the housing market in the 1930s that now correlates to the places where there is the highest levels of community violence exposure. So it was really looking to make that connection. So I'm looking, looking to see somewhere we could find some, some explicit racially, uh, place-based racial discrimination and then what that means in terms of today's um, concentrations of violence in the city. But also that things don't really, they haven't perhaps changed in terms of investment in city spaces over time, at least in this 80 year time frame. Hi, uh, I'm Molly Francis, thanks. This was really interesting. Um, I actually had a question. Um, you were talking about investing in the place, um, in places. And so I was wondering if you had carried out kind of the next step and looked at what's happening to these people after they're getting assaulted. Um, and so whether where they are on the map, how that maps to the survivability of the gunshots. And also to look at um, where the trauma systems are placed within the city because you would, it would, you would sure. want them to be more in the red areas. Um, but I imagine just based on investment, they're probably not always in there. Um, so I was wondering if you'd kind of take it Well, back. sure, those are like those, so my personal work, this was, this again, was really a thought experiment and was really the, the a function of, of sharing an office with people from different disciplines. But that said, my personal work is on understanding recovery environments and so how people are exposed to different, uh, to different kinds of rec recovery environments after being shot and what that means to how well they, they, they recover both from a physical and a psychological standpoint. So, um, but the other piece that you're asking about is the distribution of trauma centers in the city. And actually most of the, most of the trauma centers are, the strongest concentration is in Center City. It's a, so they were actually quite close to the red zoned areas of the city. There are eight trauma one centers in Philadelphia and they're pretty well distributed but mostly concentrated in the core. Uh, but I, we do look at, we have done a lot of uh, research. I know that in Chicago, there was, a, there was a study recently that looked at trauma deserts. So the relationships between racial segregation and the location of both firearm um, violence and also trauma equipped hospitals. Um, we have sort of less so in Philadelphia because of the distribution, but that certainly does occur in many cities with historical um, antecedents to racial segregation, yeah. Great, thank you. Sure. Is this one on? Is it on? Yeah, okay. Um, so given the um, concentrated disadvantage, uh, disinvestment that at least what appears to be partly driven by the policy decision dating back to 1937, um, 
what what things have been done by the city and or the state to try to rectify any of this uh, new you know other investment programs other efforts to try to change what this map looks like I mean Baltimore has its own history trying to do that I don't think it's been super successful but um, I'm just sort of curious if you know much about that is that something you've examined um, I know that I I'm quite sure that the state has done very little. Um, the, the city itself, I don't, it's interesting because even in enacting the, uh, the trials of greening or you know the, the doors and windows program, there's a lot of, it's not, it's not an easy process, even though there might be some evidence that it's going to work. There's, there, there's a lot of bureaucracy within the city that makes it more difficult. Mm -hmm. I think that the city is, is very interested right now in its or in the core in the center city neighborhood in attracting um, more business and development to improve the economy, which has been a, you know has been a depressity for a very long time. Um, but interestingly, a a, a, um, a an advertising and sort of social media group actually recently got a a grant um, to begin to explore redlining and teaching communities about their history of redlining in the places that they lived. So this is, that should be, that's something that was just granted maybe six months ago, but they want to create like interactive maps so that residents can understand the history of redlining in the place that they live and in, 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 you know, in situ, so to speak, um, particularly in the, the, the divested periphery of the city. So that should, that will be, that may, it's not necessarily a city, initiative but it might be an interesting um, mm -hmm. twist on this whole okay. story yeah okay. um, I I guess one of the questions that I have is um, how if you look at the um, education system the public education system in the city uh, if you were to map that on on this would you see similar trends in terms of like school readiness, graduation rates, and then do you think maybe potentially um, a policy solution that could be discussed would be uh, enabling students who are going to schools in the districts that were historically or redlined, enabling them to go to schools in the blue lined or, or green line districts, and then along the same lines, what you were just saying, I think a lot of people don't understand this history. I don't think it's taught in public schools. I remember learning about FDR and the New Deal, nothing about you know this and how the impact it has on today uh, and how you think that discussing that could potentially influence legislators to think about bigger changes in terms of policies to sort of like right the wrong that was done in the past? I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think it, it I think that um, certainly like just knowing the city, places that are on this map that were like red, line, red or yellow are the places where there are some of the public schools that have the most problems. I mean, in Philadelphia, probably, I don't know how Baltimore works, but Students also will self-select, those, so those that are higher achieving will go to, not self-select, but be admitted to schools maybe that aren't necessarily where they live. They may travel an hour or two to get to school because they're going to schools that have more resources or that meet their needs in different ways. So the public school system, which is really problematic in Philadelphia, is not necessarily reflected by the geography of the school itself, mm -hmm. um, but it would, it, would be, it would be interesting to, to look at that. Um, what was the second part of your question? Remind me. I guess I was I I was asking if you think that for uh, oh. if legislators understood this map and it was more more people understood how this impacts today, if it would sort of be like a catalyst for change. Perhaps I think that one of the things that like one of the caveats that I maybe didn't say clear enough is that we don't really have great evidence that this exact map 
translated to mortgage lending. You know, and then there's some evidence actually to the um, not to the contrary, but that this was that that it's not that this map itself was distributed and then the banks were doing were, were lending on the basis thereof. What it is is it's, it was like it's one of the only representations that we had, I think, or that I could find that is that explicitly demonstrates place-based discrimination, but the, the, the intent for place-based discrimination on the basis of explicit racial and ethnic categories. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, I would think it was just, it, it's sort of this artifact of discriminatory, discriminatory thought in the 1930s. Right. Um, but we don't really have great evidence, and we'd have to look over time and the different mortgage lending um, uh, rates and, and, um, and availability for every year between then and now to really have a sense of, of the larger patterns of, of uh, economic subsidy of housing ownership and then what that means in terms of these other health outcomes that we're looking at or, or um, just public amenity outcomes. I'm gonna jump in again. Um, how close do you think these, uh, the, your, the red lines there, the, um, would correlate with um, illegal drug markets in Philadelphia. And w w yeah. I think sort of related to that is I, I was intrigued by how the relationships were so much stronger for firearm violence yeah. versus violence more generally. Mm -hmm. And I've been studying this stuff for a while and we know that um, the one reason that drug markets are particularly lethal and, and violent is is guns, right? So do you sure. think that those are connected here? The, the to some degree, let me go back to the, um, to, to the firearm violence um, hot spots and I can show you where. So our biggest hot spot in the city, um, can I just go point? Let me just go point. It. So our uh, the biggest hotspot is probably this area right here. It's called the the Philadelphia Badlands, and part of the reason it's it's the heart of the heroin market in the city. Part of the reason it, it stays that way is because it's really got really nice access to um, I ninety five, so people come in and out of that area very easily. That's and it's gang controlled by mostly Puerto Rican gangs. Um, and then the other hotspots are in west and southwest Philadelphia. So I, I think it, it more or less does. Um, although this, this particular blip, I, I don't, you know, it's hard to know because the demographics of that area have changed so much in the last um, 80 years. I, it was on the border, I guess, of what was a desirable place to, to put property. And it looks very different in terms of the housing stock. That, that, that area looks, it's a newer area of the city relatively. Uh, sorry for taking the floor again. Yeah. I'm interested to know the, the, why it is like this. I mean, I understand the white area surrounded by red area is the center of the city, right? So where I come from, come from the situation is very different residential area closer to the center of city is a very good area. So why the re people who live in the center, close to the center of the city are like? In the 1930s and yeah, 40s? In, even in 1930s. Sure, there was that. There was a lot of industry there and it was access to the ports, which were a lot of workers for the working on, working at the docks, which were, which are sort of like right here throughout this area. So it, it was more of that it was, it was probably um, workers. It was also the W.B.B. Du Bois did his, his famous sociologic study on uh, the relationship between racism and built environment was in Philadelphia. And the, his neighborhood of interest was, is this, is, is, this swath of land right here. So that in the 1930s, that was all, all predominantly African American and also dock workers in these red areas. So at the time, I guess it didn't matter that it was near the center of the city. The, most people wanted to move out towards the, I guess what was farmland or more uh, rural spaces and into bigger homes in the north and northeast parts of the city. But I understand in the center of the city, there are a lot of other industry like city office and kind of good 
companies、yeah. as well. So, why people who work in those premises do not live close to them? I'm not sure.、So、I mean, the, the housing stock is much larger on the, the, the outside of the city. Like, so, these are mostly row homes in these areas, connected、mm-hmm. row homes as opposed to freestanding larger homes. So, I guess people who are working in the city. Wanted house. I, that, this is outside of my expertise. I'm not sure exactly of why, of housing sh- choices in the 1940s. But I do know that it was a lot of dock workers, a lot of people who worked、um, uh, at the riverfront,、um, and in industry lived in that part of the city at, in the 1930s and 40s.、Mm, yeah, thanks. Yeah, still, still, yeah, it, I, I don't understand why <laughs> it can be like this. I'm sure we can look at it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Well, one thing I, I don't think you mentioned, but perhaps it's worth noting or saying something about is before FDR did anything with respect to you know,、uh, manipulating mortgage markets or whatever,、um, there was racial and socioeconomic segregation, right? Yeah. Um, so, I、um, guess what I'm, I'm curious about is did that policy?、Um, anybody, do you know if anybody's done any comparative across cities that didn't? You said there were 238, I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, They were the big 238, which makes it a little bit harder to find.、So、I think、no、comparison cities is that they were, these were the cities, they were trying to drive the housing market by driving all the big population cities. So, which, you know, so I don't know that there's really good comparison so really cities. Kind of it certainly was likely that it, it,、uh, is that it, it reinforced、sure. what was already there.、Right. Um, I mean, in, in certain cities, it, cha- it really changed. The, like in New York, in, the, in Brooklyn, it totally changed the, the, the demography of the population.、Mm-hmm. Less so in Phil- Philadelphia, has been much, much slower in its change.、Mm-hmm. But it really, it really shifted. A long, long time ago, I did a little bit of research about this period of time that you're looking at. And whereas the,、uh, the, the redlining, the districts, enable the lenders to know、uh, the security or, or the subprime、uh, products yeah, they would、subprime. offer in those areas. But also, the, the act that FDR put together was. To enable the、uh, mortgage lenders to have a secondary market. So it wasn't just to create stable、oh, home、yeah. ownership, it was to allow the lending industry a secondary market where they could sort of、uh, recycle their, their money. So we hear about it in terms of housing, but actually it was a, a business driven decision to let the lenders sort of replenish their money by selling their loans on the secondary market. And I think the zones established the.、Uh, The value of those secondary market、yes. products, right? Right. So, so you're going to see a big jump in sort of the housing values of those who had access to, to, to mortgages in the, in the green and blue zones and those that did not. And it, yes, it was absolutely. And then there was a lot of, over time, there was different levels of, like, of, sell, of,、uh, of sell off. A lot of, like, there w a s a lot of people that,、um, that got loans initially and then lost them. And so where they chose to reinvest. Was very, very specific and very, again, racialized. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.